Okay, can uh, you please okay, confirm can, that uh, you can hear me? Actually, I don't need you to confirm that because I just heard myself on the, on the tablet here. Okay, good. Um, can we use the formula that no ways for choosing the repetition n choose n choose r, I guess, equals n plus r minus 1 factorial over n minus r factorial r factorial for question 4 in assignment 1. Uh, I don't know. You should talk to a TA. Uh, I can't, uh, can't really answer that online without, or up here without uh, the assignment right in front of me, and I don't think it would make sense for, uh, for other people. Uh, okay, the question is, do the assignments get easier from here? Um, sure. Uh, now that you've, uh, you know, gotten the, the first hard one out of the way, uh, you know what to expect, let's say that they, they get easier. Still have a couple of minutes if you want to ask any other questions. And give me one second to turn off some noisy things in my house. question about 2402. Uh, I don't want to answer that because uh, that's not this class. Um, again, there's lots and lots of TA hours if you have, uh, if you have questions about 2402. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, Johnny Lee de Demer Medeiros. Uh, soon you will have it out of the way, uh, one way or the other. So if you have uh, specific questions about the assignment, um, please come to some office hours. I had uh, a great office hour session yesterday. Uh, it worked very well. I used Google Meet. Uh, some other people may, use, may choose to use Zoom instead, but uh, you can get all your detailed questions uh, answered. And we, we really have office hours every day, morning and afternoon. Uh -huh. So the midterm date uh, changed on the home page. So indeed, the midterm uh, was vaguely scheduled for some range of, of dates uh, initially. Um, it's actually going to be whatever is written on the, the home page, which is not an official uh, class time for this class. It's actually an official class time for the other section, but, uh, but that's when it is. Um, so hopefully it... Uh, uh, it works for you. Um, if not, then uh, for some reason that uh, is acceptable, then your option is to not write the midterm and uh, instead shift all the weight from the midterm onto the final exam. I don't recommend that if you have uh, any other alternative. Okay, so last question is, with respect to the Vandermond's uh, theorem, <coughs> uh, do you need to understand how you prove it, or do you just need to know what it is so that you can use it? Um, certainly when you're doing an assignment, uh, if you can use Vandermond's theorem to solve one of the questions, 
then all you have to do is say, we're going to use van der Man's theorem with these values of m, n, and r, uh, and that, that solves it, so you, you only need to know it in that sense. On the other hand, um, you need to know how you proved it. Well, there will be things where that kind of proof technique, which was this, uh, this counting in two different ways, uh, is used uh, to solve problems on, on assignments. So uh, knowing that proof exactly, uh, word for word, you don't have to memorize it, but you should know the technique so that you can use it yourself. Okay, um, so let's uh, we'll start with a sort of brief a review. And starting with uh, something we proved last class, which was Pascal's identity that says n plus 1 choose k <coughs> is uh, n choose k plus n choose k minus 1. Uh, and remember, you can sort of remember that by saying, well, if I have a set of size n plus 1, um, let's treat one of the elements as special element. And then when I take a subset, uh, either I include the special element and k minus 1 other elements, or I don't include the special element and I take all my other elements from uh, non-special elements. Okay. So the non-special elements are of size, set of size n, um, and so either I'm choosing a set of size k from a set of size n, or I'm choosing a set of size k minus 1 plus the special element. Um, and that gives rise to this very famous Pascal's triangle, um, which lists out the binomial coefficients in a sort of triangle shape. So, for instance, uh, at the top of Pascal's triangle is 0 choose 0. So, how many uh, ways are there to choose an empty set from an empty set? There's exactly one way. The next row uh, is 1 choose 0 followed by 1 choose 1. Uh, right? So, number of ways to pick an empty set from a set of size 1. There's only one, it's the empty set. The number of ways of choosing a subset of size 1 from a set of size 1. There's only one way. You take that, that element and put it in the set. And this goes on, uh, row by row by row, where the, the row n uh, gives you the coefficients n choose k, for k equals 0 all the way up to, to n. Um, and Pascal's identity shows up in here because if you look at any coefficient, uh, let's say these, in, these interior ones, it's always the sum of the two above it, right? This is row n plus 1, uh, this is the, the k, then you take row n, coefficient k minus 1, and coefficient k. So this is n plus 1 choose k, this is n choose k minus 1, this is n choose uh, k. All right. Um, so that's where Pascal's identity uh, shows up in there. And then we saw a generalization of Pascal's identity, which was this Vandermond uh, identity. Um, and the Vandermond identity uh, says, well, instead of uh, just n plus 1, let's say it's n plus m. Uh, we change from, from k to r, and we get a formula that instead of having two terms, Right? So here, for example, um, this is like when we take uh, Pascal is what we get when we set m equal to 1, um, and then we get these two terms. That's exactly what we would get here. Uh, but when we take a larger value of, of, uh, of m, we get, uh, we get these, these r terms. Okay. Um, so where does it show up? In here, uh, it's not quite so obvious, right? Because you're looking at row m plus n, and you're then looking at the two rows. So this is 6, uh, and it tells us that we could look at, uh, well, 6 is 4 plus 2, so we would be looking at row 4, 
and row two. Um, and then uh, somehow uh, uh, you know, taking things and, and multiplying them, and somehow we get the, some, some entry over here. So it's not obvious in its full generality what it's, what it's telling us, but we'll see a, a, a special version of it in a second that, that makes some kind of sense. Uh, here's another easy one that we, we saw. Um, if I want to choose uh, k elements from a set of size n, uh, the obvious way to do that is to directly choose the k elements, and so there's n choose k ways to do that, or I can choose n minus k elements and throw them away, uh, and then I'm left with a set of k elements, so there's that many ways to, to do that. In either case, I, I'm, I finish with uh, a set of, uh, of size k, um, so these, these two things are equal, and that shows up here in Pascal's triangle as this central symmetry, right? Um, here we have 4 choose 1, and here we have 4 choose 3. Here we have uh, 5 choose 2, and here we have 5 choose 3. Um, so those, those things, uh, the, the triangle is symmetric around the, the center here. That's what this, this tells us. Okay. Um, and here's a really strange looking one. It says that 2n choose n is what you get when you uh, sum uh, k from 0 to n of n choose k squared. So what does that look like in Pascal's triangle? Well, let's say 2n is equal to 6, which means n is equal to 3. So uh, this is 0, 1, 2, 3. So this is 6 choose 3. And it says, well, we should look up to row n. That's row 3. We take each element in row n and we square it. So we get 1 squared plus 3 squared plus uh, 3 squared again, plus 1 squared. This is 1, this is 9, this is another 9, and this is 1, and indeed, we get 20. Okay. So 1 squared plus 3 squared plus 3 squared plus uh, 1 is equal to 20. Um, and that looks like magic. But it's actually not. Um, it's not even as exciting as Vandermond's theorem because it's really a, an easy special case of it. So how would we prove this? Uh, so we use Vandermond. With m is equal to n. If I take m equal to n here, then on top, I'm getting 2n, which is what I, I have here. Uh, and r is equal to n. So this becomes 2n choose n, 2n choose n, good. So that cell tells us that that's equal to the right-hand side, and if we fill that out, we're going to get the sum k equals 0 to n of, well, n is, m is n, so we get n choose k. Here we get n choose uh, n minus k. And here we've seen already that n choose k equals n choose n minus k. So this is just the sum k equals 0 to n of n choose k squared, because this thing is just another n choose k. So this very strange uh, and sort of beautiful thing happens that if I want the center of row 2n, then I just sum up the squares of the uh, values in row n. 
and you can uh, you can check it here. Row four is six. Uh, it has six at the center, and here we get one plus two squared is four plus one gives us six. So for any of the even rows, you can get the center value by uh, by looking up half as many many rows. Uh, what is the name of the theorem? It is hard to recognize it. Uh, it, it doesn't have a name. It's just some, some identity. It says someone on the board. Um, what are the third and fourth definition names on the left? Easy and someone. Um, so no, no real, uh, these identities aren't named there. They're so easy. Okay, good. So we've been working with a bunch of different techniques uh, for counting. We've seen starting with the product rule, then the complement rule, the sum rule, the principle of inclusion exclusion. Uh, we learned that binomial coefficients count uh, the number of, uh, of subsets uh, of a given size. So let's let's start putting some of these things together and solving some problems and today is a particularly useful lecture for problems on assignment one um, some of the problems there uh, you will see what you you need to to solve them um, so Let's say, how many um, rearrangements of the string Well, let's start with an easy one, Rocky. are there. So we'll start with something easy and then move on to something uh, a little bit harder. So the string Rocky, and so by rearrangements I, I really mean um, distinct permutations. Um, so, you know, think of these letters in here. R corresponds to 1, O corresponds to 2, C corresponds to 3, k to 4 and y to 5. Um, how many different permutations of, of this thing are there? Well, um, in general, if you have uh, five distinct elements, then the number of permutations uh, of those elements is 5 factorial. Okay. So there's the question, and here's the answer. It's 5 factorial. So take any permutation of these there. If I list out all the permutations, I'll get five factorial of them. And you can see that because there's a correspondence between those, a one-to-one, -one, uh, basically a bijection between the, the permutations of R, O, C, K, and Y and the permutations of one, two, three, four, five. So that's one, one way to, to see it. Now, let's change the question just a little bit. Instead of Rocky, let's say how many permutations of the string success are there? So the tempting thing is to try exactly the same approach. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven letters in success. So uh, there's seven factorial permutations of the integers 1 through 7, um, and so maybe you think the answer is 7 factorial. And if you do that, uh, if you think that, then you think wrong, and the reason is uh, there's not a bijection between permutations of 1 through 7 and permutations of these seven letters. Problem is, uh, 
if I try and make such a, a bijection using the obvious thing, like the first letter is, corresponds to one, the second letter corresponds to two, and so on, then we get permutations like this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and one, two, four, three, five, six, seven. Um, so there's two different permutations of seven uh, of those numbers, one through seven. They're different because four and three uh, are not in the same, same position. But if I map those back to the letters, well, one is S, two is U, three is, uh, is C. So here we get C. Uh, here we get four. That's also C. Okay, so they're the same there. And the same thing happens here. And then five is E, six is S, seven is S. So we have two different permutations. Uh, that give us the same string. And in, a, in our standard diagram of, of functions, what this means is we have, maybe this is the set of permutations. Of one to seven, this is the set of rearrangements of that string success, well, I just showed you two different permutations which give me the same string uh, over here. Um, so the bijection rule, if we could find a bijection between these two sets, we would know they have the same size, but the thing that I've defined here is not a bijection. In particular, it's not one to one. Uh, here you see it's, it's at least two to one at, at this particular location. So, we're going to have to go back and work at this uh, more carefully. And we'll go back to sort of uh, lecture, let's say lecture one, uh, the first day being lecture zero. And uh, we'll just think intuitively about how we would write down one of these permutations. So or one of these arrangements of the string success. So get rid of these numbers because they don't make sense anymore. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, so ultimately we're gonna write, you know, we have seven spaces to fill in and uh, we're gonna fill them all in with, uh, with, with these, these letters and uh, if we look at this string, uh, what have we got here? We have three S's. We have one U. We have two C's and one E. So, um, when in doubt, use the product rule. So, uh, well, what's the, the procedure? Well, I need to use up all of these letters, um, the three S's, the one U, the two C's, and the, the one E. So maybe I'll just start by writing down all the S's. Okay. Step one. write down three S's. Okay. So we have seven locations in the final string and we choose three of those to put S's in. Maybe we choose this one, this one, and this one. Well, what's the number of ways to do different possible ways to do that? Well, it's seven, choose three. So we get seven, choose three. Step two, 
is we write down 1 u. So how many uh, ways are there to do that? Well, we have to write the u in one of these empty slots. And so there's one, two, three, four possible places to put the u. So the uh, number of uh, ways to write one u is I have to choose one of those four places. So the answer is going to be four, choose one. I'll put the u somewhere, maybe there. All right, next step, write down two c's. So I have one, two, three possible locations left, and I need to pick two of those to put down, uh, to put a C in. So maybe I'll choose this one and this one, but you know, of three locations, I had to choose two of them. And then the final step is to write down one, E. How many locations are left? Well, there's one location left. Uh, so that means there's only one choose, uh, one ways of choosing a, a location for E, which means there's not really any choice at all. One choose one. Okay. So that's the number of uh, different ways uh, or so this is this is a procedure for writing this this thing down and you know step one we can execute seven choose three ways step two four choose one ways step three uh, three choose two ways and finally uh, step four we can we can execute one choose one way uh, and so the answer by the product rule is the product of these things seven choose three times 4 choose 1 times 3 choose 2 times 1 choose 1. All right. So, uh, you know, a slight change of the problem uh, going from the word rocky, which has all distinct letters, to the word success, which has some letters repeated, changes the answer a lot. We went from a simple formula that uh, was a, a factorial formula, um, just one you know, n factorial, uh, to this more, more complicated thing. Um, so a few things to, to note. One is, for the string Rocky, we could have done it this very long way, right? And we still would have got the answer 5 factorial because our procedure would be a five-step procedure, which would be choose the location to write down the R, there's five choices, then choose the location to write the O, there's four choices, then choose the location to write the C, there's uh, three choices, then the K, there's two choices, and finally the Y, there's, uh, there's only one, one choice. So you'll get five factorial that way. Um, the other thing to note about this and this helps explain maybe why, um, why this counting two ways or this combinatorial proofs uh, lead can give so many different identities. Um, and a lot of it has to do with the product rule and the, the flexibility that there is in the product rule. Because I can write down a different procedure here. Uh, for instance, step one is Choose the locations for u. Well, there's, there's, choose the, the location uh, for u. Sorry, there's only one u. And there's seven choose one ways to do that. Step two, maybe, is choose the locations for C. And 
and well there's two C's and six spots left so that's going to be six choose two and now maybe step uh, three is uh, choose the locations for uh, S well after I've written the C's there's one, two, three, four spots left and uh, there's three S's that I have to write so that's going to be four choose three and then finally step four is choose the location for E Once I've put the S's, there's only one location left to put the E, so that's one choose one. And so I get an answer which is seven choose one times six choose two, four choose three, and one choose one. Uh, that's also a correct answer. So the number of rearrangements of the string success is equal to this number. 7 choose 1, 6 choose times 6 choose 2 times 4 choose 3 times 1 choose 1. But it's also equal to this number. 7 choose 3 times 4 choose 1 times 3 choose 2 times 1 choose 1. So actually that means these two numbers are equal. And on the surface just looking at these two formulas, um, you wouldn't have guessed that those two things are, are equal. Now, you can write them out longhand. Uh, well, in fact, you can just evaluate, you know, calculate what number this gives you, uh, and calculate what number this gives you, and you'll see that they're the, the same thing. Um, more sort of generically, you can write this out using the formula um, this n choose k equals n factorial over k factorial, n minus k factorial for each of these things. And then start carefully doing cancellations um, or, uh, and you'll realize that way that, uh, that they're the same. But um, it's not at all obvious. And it somehow, this, this counting, just doing the same exercise two different ways, proves what's a, kind of a non-trivial identity. So if you want to impress people with uh, identities that you invent, um, just come up with convoluted ways of counting things that are easy to count uh, some other, and there's a simple way to count them, and you come up with some other convoluted way to do it, and, uh, and you'll get two different looking formulas and say, oh look, this cool identity that I just, uh, I just proved. Uh, can we use a uh, short method uh, like for this case 7 factorial divided by number of times a letter appears? So here it would be, uh, can we do that in the assignment? Um, so the, the question is, can we uh, cheat here and say, well, there's 7 factorial permutations of a string that has distinct letters, um, but the letters aren't distinct. In particular, uh, where I was treating the three occurrences of S as distinct, they, uh, they're not really, and so every permutation, um, if it, just thinking about the S's for a second, um, every permutation uh, or every rearrangement will have three factorial permutations that put the S's at those, those locations. Um, so can you just do something like 7 factorial over 3 factorial uh, times 2 factorial times 1 factorial times 1 factorial? Um, yes, this gives the correct answer and indeed this is what's called the, the multinomial formula um, but I, I, you know, for an assignment, and especially early on like this, 
I, I would just um, I, I would go ahead and, and do the, the steps. It doesn't take long. Shows that you understand. Um, that there's a danger here. This is what you think of as factoring out symmetries. Um, but you have to be really careful, right? Because what to, to, for this to work, you're defining a function in which uh, everything on the right has exactly the same number of things on the left going to it. Okay? And in this case, that number is 3 factorial, 2 factorial, 1 factorial, 1 factorial. Um, right. Now, of course, if you have that, then you know that the thing on the left is this, you know, how much bigger is the thing on the left? Well, it's bigger by a factor of this much, because for every one thing on the right, there's this many things and the distinct things on the, the left. Um, but, you know, you have to then very carefully argue that whatever you're doing, uh, so either you do this counting, or you define this, uh, explicitly define this, this thing, and then prove that it's not one to one, but it's uh, three factorial, two factorial, one factorial to one factorial to one, uh, which is probably harder to do than just, uh, just going through these steps. All right. Um, now to something that is extremely relevant for the assignment. So here's the question. How many solutions to the equation x1 plus x2 plus x3 equals 11 are there where each of x1, x2, and x3 is bigger than or equal to 0, and x1, x2, x3 are integers. Okay. So for example, Here's one solution to that equation. Uh, x1 equals 5, uh, x2 equals 6, x3 equals 0. Okay. So that's one solution to this, uh, this equation. Um, but here's another one. So I'll use the shorthand now. Uh, I could have 1. 1, and so this is x1, this is x2, and then the last one should be 9. Or I could have 1, 2, and 8. Right. So these are all solutions to that, uh, that equation. There are three non-negative integers whose sum is uh, 11. Okay. Um, and they're, they're ordered, so x1, x2, and x3 are different. So, you know, this 8, uh, this is a different solution, right? So, in this solution, x1 equals 1, in this solution, x1 equals 8, we treat those, those things as, uh, as different. All right. Um, Does anybody want to, uh, well, 
I guess I won't ask. Most people who know will have uh, already read a ahead, but we have to think about this one. And this is a question that doesn't, uh, it's not hard, or the solution is not hard once you see it, but it's something that would take a little bit of time to come up with. Um, again, it's another example of one of these things that, yeah, very simple rules, and in the end, a very simple solution, but it takes some kind of flash of insight to, uh, to come up with this thing. Um, so let's, uh, let, let's pause that for just one second. Um, and just think about equations like this and what, what they, they represent uh, or what they're useful for. Um, right, so this looks like number of solutions to some, some equation. Uh, but, I mean, how to think about, or, or think about this in terms of, of applications. Uh, you know, imagine that uh, someone has a fruit stand that has apples, oranges, and bananas. And for ten dollars, you get to take eleven fruits. So there's a sale on. For ten dollars, you get to take eleven fruits from this fruit stand. So then the question is, how many ways are there to take eleven fruits from this fruit stand? Well, these are all beautiful apples, they're all the same. Uh, they're all beautiful oranges, they're all the same. They're all beautiful bananas, they're all the same. But of course, an, an orange and a banana is for two different things. Uh, and an apple and a, a banana is a, a different thing. So really, what I'm asking is, well, um, you know, how many ways are there to split these 11 things up into these three categories? How many apples, how many oranges, and how many bananas? Well. If the number of apples that I take, I call that x1, the number of oranges I take, I call that x2, and the number of bananas I take, I call that x3, then this really is asking, what is the number of integer solutions to x1 plus x2 plus x3 equals 11? So it's a, a very useful, uh, I mean, it, it looks like some boring, uh, formula that has no bearing on anything, but actually uh, this models exactly this, this kind of problem where you have a few different categories, three in this case, and you're allowed to choose a fixed number of things, 11 in this case, from those, uh, those categories. How many different ways are there to, to do that? Okay. Now, now that you've seen why this is useful, um, how do you solve it? Well, here's the, the insight. So let me uh, just write down There, I've just written down uh, 13 shapes, I don't know, boxes or, or bins. All right. Now, let's look at what happens if I choose two of those. Maybe these two. So these are numbered in order, bins 1 through 13. And I choose two of them, and you can imagine that I, 
I take those things away, so now I have three bins in a row, then a gap, and then one bin, and then a gap, and then uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven bins. Okay. So if I take away those two, um, the total number of bins that I have left is still uh, is still um, thir uh, sorry is, is eleven. So thirteen minus two is eleven. Um, but they're kind of broken up into three sets, right? Three in a row, well, then one by itself, and then uh, then seven in a row. So that kind of naturally defines three numbers. In particular, this is three, this is one, and this is seven. And the sum of those three numbers is eleven. Right? Because that's the sum of those three numbers is just the number of bins I have left after taking away two of them. Uh, so then really I can think of, well this defines a solution to this equation. x1 is 3, x2 is 1, and x3 is 7. So really any time I pick two of these numbers what I get is three ranges. So, um, how many bins are there before the smaller number? In this case, there's three. Then, how many bins are there between the smaller number and the larger number? In this case, there's one. And how many bins are there after the larger number? In this case, there's seven. And indeed, anytime I choose two different uh, numbers here, um, to take away, two different bins to take away, I will get different solutions to this equation. There will definitely be a solution and they will definitely be, uh, be different. So there's a bijection here between choices of bins, of two bins, and solutions to these, this equation. Or if you like, uh, think of it this way, I want to write down a bit string of length 13 that has exactly two ones in it. And then I measure the distance, the number of zeros before the first one, the number of zeros between the first and second one, and the number of zeros after the second one. And that gives me these three values again, 3, 1, and 7, um, that sum up, to, uh, sum up to 11. So there is a bijection between bit strings of length 13 with exactly two ones and the set of solutions. So that means the number of bit strings of length 13 with exactly two ones and the number of solutions is the same. That's the the bijection rule it says that if, these, uh, if there's a bijection between two sets, in this case it's bit strings of length 13 with two ones, and the other set is the, the, the set of solutions to, to this equation, then uh, the two sets have the same size. But uh, bit strings of length 13 with exactly two ones, we already actually did exactly that example, and we can see it from here. Um, the, the way you get one of those bit strings is you choose 
from the 13 possible locations, you choose the two locations for the ones, and everything else becomes zero. So the answer then is 13 choose 2. Okay. Would anyone like to ask me something about that? Okay, so um, this was a very specific example with the specific numbers, uh, 11 and three variables, x1, x2, x3. But more generally, um, if I have x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4 all the way up to uh, xk, and I want to get those things to sum to n, I want them all to be non-negative and all to be integers, then this is the formula you get. And where is this coming from? Well, it's exactly the same thing. You put down, you imagine drawing all your bins. This time the number of bins is n plus k minus 1. Now you choose k minus 1 places. And the values that you get for, you know, the value of x1 is all of the bins up to, count the number of bins up to the first choice. Or if you're thinking of bit strings, count the number of zeros up to the first one. And the value of x2 is you count the number of zeros between the, the first one and the second one. The value of x3 is you count the number of zeros between the second one and the third one. And finally, the value of xk is you count the number of zeros after the k minus 1, 1, because there's only k minus 1 once. So that's the general, uh, general formula. All right, seem easy? Time for questions here, if you'd like to make me pause and ask a question. So, since there are no questions, I can safely assume that everyone understands this perfectly and can use it, prove it, and know what it's good for. So, let me ask a slightly different question.
So this question here asks for the number of solutions to a particular equation. And by e equation, what's implicit in there is that there's a left-hand side and a right-hand side, and there's an equals in the middle. So what about if I'm interested in inequations, where instead of an equality, I have an inequality? So, instead of having x1 plus x2 plus x3 add up to exactly 11, um, I just want to make sure that they don't add up to uh, they they don't add up to more than 11. Okay. And from the point of view of the fruit stand, um, that's probably something the fruit vendor would let you do, right? You give them $10, you're allowed to take away uh, 11 fruits, any combinations of apples, oranges, and bananas. Um, but actually, the, the fruit vendor is not going to complain if you only take nine fruits. They're not going to complain if you only take two fruits. They get their $10, and, uh, and they, even, you know, they don't have to give away as, uh, as much for the, that $10. So as, uh, as a consumer, actually the number of options you have for what you take away from that fruit stand is more like the number of solutions to this inequality rather than the, the number of solutions to the equality. Okay. Um, yes, so someone asks, can we use this theorem directly in the assignment? Yes. Um, Go ahead, I either say that it was from class, but even better would be to just look in the textbook, right? There's pointers to all the sections in the textbook for each lecture. Uh, find the theorem. This theorem is in the textbook. Um, and say, by the theorem, whatever it is, uh, 3.79 in the textbook, uh, this, is, this is what you, you're using. So you're allowed to use theorems that appear in the textbook. Um, without having to, to prove them from, from scratch. Okay. So, back to this. Now we have an inequality and not an equality. Looks, uh, looks very different. Um, there are two ways to solve this. So here's one of them. Um, one approach is to use the sum rule. So for each uh, n in 0 up to 11, let Sn be the solutions right so um, I just say well if you add up to less than 11 and everything is non-negative or less than or equal to 11 and everything is non-negative, then either you add up to 0, or you add up to 1, or you add up to 2, or you add up to 3, or the sum is, uh, or you add up to all the way up to, to 11. So we have all these possible solutions of things that add to less than or equal to 11, and we partition them into 12 different categories. The ones where the sum is 0, the ones where the sum is 1, the ones where the sum is 2, and, and so on. Okay. So, by the sum rule, the total number of solutions to x1 plus x2 plus x3 is less than or equal to 11 is, uh, well, it's the size of S0 plus the size of S1 
plus the size of S2, and so on. Right, the solutions that add up to zero, they're definitely disjoint from the solutions that add up to one. They're, they're different because they, they add up to different numbers. Um, and so these are pairwise disjoint sets, but together you take their union um, and you get all of the solutions that add up to less than or equal to 11. Um, and this thing here gives us formulas for all of these things. Right. In each case, we have three variables. Uh, so k is 3. And, uh, well, the value of n keeps changing. But we can get the answer uh, easily. It looks like this. Uh, this one here is n equals 0, so 0 plus uh, k minus 1, k is 3, so 0 plus 2, choose 2. So this is 2, choose 2. This one here is 3, choose 2. This one here is 4, choose 2 and so on, all the way up to 13, choose 2. So, there's an answer. You use the sum rule, and you calculate the sizes of each of these sets individually using this theorem here. Good. Any questions about that? Right. Someone says 14 choose 3. Um, so somebody else, so this is the answer, and someone else proposes that the answer is 14 choose 3. And uh, now you should say, but wait a minute, those are two different answers. There's this answer that I got here using the sum rule. And now someone is saying that this is the answer, which doesn't look anything like this, right? This is all products and divisors, right? This is a, just a, uh, you know, 14 times, uh, 14 times 13 times 12 divided by uh, 6. And this is a sum of a bunch of things. It would be miraculous if these two things were equal. So you might scoff and say, okay, that's a, that's a bad uh, answer. We'll just not even uh, try and check this. Um, so why, why this? Well, let's solve this a different way. So this is approach one using the sum rule. Now, so the question is, is this equal to 14 choose 3? Um, and the way to show that these two things are equal is either through a lot of grinding through the math uh, or using Python to, uh, to evaluate this, both things exactly for us. Um, but the the way that's going to tell us, give us more information, is to just try and prove that the number of solutions is equal to this directly. Um, and then we'll know that these two things are the same, uh, because both of these two things are equal to the number of solutions uh, to this, this inequality. So 14 choose 3. Um, before, we had an answer that was 13 choose 2. And the way we got that answer was we uh, imagined bit strings so we set up this picture where we had um, we had 13 boxes 
and we placed two things uh, in the boxes. So if we want to, you know, follow the same sort of uh, thinking, well, let's start with 14 boxes. And the fact that there's a three on the bottom here suggests that we should choose uh, three things, three of those boxes. So I don't know, let's choose three of them. And now the claim is that somehow this gives us values of x1, x2, and x3 that add up to uh, add up to something smaller than 11. How do we get those values? So in this picture here, what's the value of x1? So, let's stick with the bit string view. Before, the value of x1 was the number of zeros between the first one. So here we're getting x1 equals 2. The value of x2 was the number of zeros between the first one and the second one. In this case, there's one of those. Uh, x3 was the number of zeros be well, after the, before there was the number of zeros after the second one, but now let's just have it be the number of zeros after the, uh, um, after the second one, but before the third one. So here we get x3 is equal to 4. And then there's still some more zeros here. Uh, but we don't have a name for the number of zeros there, uh, right? We already know, we already picked our x1, x2, and x3, and the formula only has those three variables. So let's just call these things y. As in, why do you exist? So, did this solve, does this give us a solution? Yeah, uh, 2 plus 1 plus 4 is equal to 7. Yep, that's less than or equal to 11, for sure. So this does give me a solution. Um, could I ever get a solution that adds up to more than 11? Well, the, the sum, the the sum of x1 plus x2 plus x3 uh, is the, you know, this, these, the number of these zeros, the number of these zeros, and the number of these zeros. But if I look at the whole string here, this is a uh, binary string of length 14. It has three ones, so that means that the number of zeros is 11. And x1, x2, and x3 count some of those zeros, not necessarily all of them. But that means that x1 plus x2 plus x3 is less than or equal to 11. So whenever we do this, we're going to get a solution. x1 plus x2 plus x3 is less than or equal to 11. Um, and so, yeah, this is going to give us, uh, it's going to give us a solution. And it is, uh, if we take two different bit strings, then we definitely get two different solutions, right? If you give me two different bit strings, well, why are those bit strings different? Um, they're different because maybe the location of the first one is different, uh, in which case x1 is different, or maybe if those are the same, then the location uh, of the second one is different, in which case x2 is different or the location of the third one is different, in which case x, x3 is different. So, um, so that's good. Uh, so indeed, 
it looks like every time we choose three uh, locations for the ones among these 14 locations, we get a solution to this equation. And if we make different choices, we get different solutions. So this is exactly the, the bijection rule. Um, there's a bijection between bit strings of length 14 and uh, with exactly three ones and solutions to this, this equation. And now, if you, uh, if you don't like that, or whether you like it or not, it doesn't, doesn't matter, but uh, this thing here, x1 plus x2 plus x3 is less than or equal to 11, uh, th there's another way you could write that, which is x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus y is equal to 11. Right? You have x1, x2, and x3, and maybe they don't add all the way up to 11, so what's left over is the value of y that you can put in here and, and get 11. Okay. So that is one of these equalities that this thing addresses with one, two, three, four variables. So k is four. Um, the value of n is 11. So we get 11 plus four minus one is 14. And k minus one, in this case, k is four. There's four variables. Choose three is the answer here. Okay. Um, yeah, so indeed this identity is true. I mean, strange looking thing. Wouldn't have guessed that from the beginning, um, but the Binomial coefficients are just full of these uh, these kinds of identities, um, and the reason that they're full of these kinds of identities is that there's just many counting problems where the answer is obviously some binomial coefficient, or maybe less obviously, but the answer is some binomial coefficient that you can get at either directly by definition or maybe with the application of the, the product rule. Um, but there's another way to count that thing using the sum rule, uh, which gives you a sum of binomial coefficients, and then you get weird identities like this. So there's, you can look up you know, binomial identities uh, and find just tons and tons of, uh, of these things. Um, too many to remember, so you're much better off uh, trying to understand them then, then remember them. In fact, it's fun to maybe look at some binomial identities, see things like this, and then try and understand what was that set in the middle that both of these things are counting. That's usually the easiest way to understand these things, is say, ah, this is you know, the set of whatever, uh, it's easy to count, show that it's equal to this, its size is equal to this, and if you use the sum rule, you get, uh, you get this answer. So these, these two things are, are equal. Um, in that case, couldn't you do 15 choose 4 and 16 choose 5? Um, OK, so somebody asks, here we cut this string into uh, four parts um, and took the first three parts and used that as our solution, x1 plus x2 plus x3. Why not cut it into five parts? Here's why you don't cut it into five parts. So let's say you did cut it into five parts, uh, which means there's another one here. So, 
take a string instead of length 15, and I put in uh, four ones, and that gives me numbers x1, x2, x3, y1, and y2. Okay. Now, um, so that suggests then, well, the, the number of ways of counting, uh, counting uh, solutions x1 plus x2 plus x3 is less than or equal to 11 should be maybe this uh, 15 choose 4. That's not true. And why is this failing? Well, here's why it's failing. Remember, underlying all this, we're using the bijection rule. And the bijection rule is uh, we're trying to establish a bijection between these bit strings and the solutions to the equation. So the equation involves x1, x2, and x3. Uh, it doesn't involve y. Uh, Y, and it, now it doesn't involve y1 or y2. Now, uh, when you only have y, you tell me x1, x2, x3, y is defined. y is whatever is left over to add up to 11. But now that I've split y into two things, y1 and y2, you tell me x1, x2, x3, y1 and y2 are not defined. So in particular, here's a bit string that gives me this answer, 2, 1, 4. But here's another bit string. So here's a different bit string that gives me the answer to 1, 4. So this fails the bijection rule because what's happening here is we have the bit strings we have the solutions and I just showed you two different bit strings that give me the same solution. Right? In particular just moving this last one around in here will always give me the same values of x, x1, x2, and x3 um, and so you'll, you'll have a, a problem there. Um, and so that's, that's why it doesn't work, okay? So 14 choose 3 is not equal to 15 choose 4 because those count different things. All right. Yeah, so you, you really have to, uh, you know, when you use the bijection rule, you have to make sure that what you have is a bijection, not... Uh, not something that's that's two to one, um, and make sure that it's uh, it's on to. So this one is on to. You can get every possible solution this way, but uh, some solutions you can get uh, different ways. Um, and actually, this is a really bad example because, unlike um, when we were counting uh, or rearrangements of the string success. One of you noticed that there's a shortcut that you just take the length of the string factorial and then divide it by these factorials of the, the repetitions. Here, that's not going to work. And the reason that that's not going to work is because, um, right, if I consider solutions where x1, x2, and x3 are equal to zero, that's always by packing uh, the first. Uh, three ones right uh, beside each other. Um, right, there's only one one of those solutions. But uh, that means that this fourth one, this fourth one, has lots of places I can put it. It still has, I guess, 12 different locations. So that means for that particular solution, uh, I can find 12 bit strings that map to that solution. On the other hand, for this solution here, x2, uh, 2, 1, 4, I'll only be able to find 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 different bit strings that map onto this particular solution. So we can't just take some obvious answer and then divide by uh, something because the, the function from bit strings onto solutions is not 1 to 1. 
It's not two to one, it's not three to one, it's not four to one. For different solutions, you have different numbers of things, uh, bit strings that map onto that solution. Uh, how do we go about solving when there's restrictions to what xi can be? Um, well, let me just tell you something. Uh, here's an example. Suppose that uh, I have an additional restriction that x2 is bigger than or equal to 2. Okay, Then introduce another variable y2 and say, uh, write it the other way, let's say if x2 is bigger than or equal to 2, that means I can write x2 equals 2 plus y2, where y2 is bigger than or equal to 0. So replace x2 with 2 plus y2 in this equation, and then see what you can do with that. So that's Nathaniel's question. Okay, so um, that's the, the lesson for today. I can answer uh, questions about this lesson if anyone has any. What do I mean by mapping for this example? Well, ultimately, uh, what we're, the, the way that we prove these things is by establishing a bijection between the bit strings with all these conditions of whatever, of a specific length with a specific number of ones onto solutions. And by solutions, I'm talking about solutions to this inequality or, or this equality. The, the mapping just means the function, which you give me a bit string and tells me the solution. Okay. So the function is count the number of zeros before the first one, that's the value of x1. Count the number of zeros between the first and second one, that's the value of x2. Count the number of zeros between the second and third one, that's the value of x3. Um, so that's what what this is, uh, that's the mapping that I'm talking about. You give it, a, give me a bit string, map it onto a solution. Should we be able to do the entire assignment from what has been covered so far? Yes. You now have absolutely everything you need to, uh, to do the assignment. Um, the last piece was, uh, was this, uh, not inequalities, but the equalities um, that you needed, but it's maybe not so much where you think. So there's a part of the assignment that deals directly with these sums uh, of things, uh, of equalities. Uh, that's fine, but that part of the assignment actually tells you what you, you need to use. Uh, more important is there's another part of the assignment where you actually use this. You need to count the number of solutions uh, to x1 plus x2 plus x something is equal to some value n. Um, you need to count the number of ways of choosing three, a total of 11 fruits from three different types of fruits, for example. Uh, yes, question one, which is actually question two on the assignment, is similar to the, the red-blue example. It's actually from the first lecture. Um, it's a generalization of the, the Ramsey uh, result that we proved in the first lecture. Um, except it's not red-blue. It's red, blue, green, yellow, orange, up to k different colors.
All right. So thanks for uh, for showing up. Um, good luck with uh, with the rest of the assignment. Please, please uh, see the TAs during their office hours. You can now see TAs from either section, um, so you, you have lots of opportunity for, for help. <laughs>